Hi, Annie. Hello. Hello, how are you? I'm very good, thank you. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Just not enjoying the windy weather so much. <laughs> it's not so enjoyable. Never no. mind. Um, all right, thanks to everyone for tuning in who's watching. Um, today we have Dr. Annie Murray with us. She has been working with the Manta Trust since 2013, so for a long time. Um, and she's worked with the Moldavian Manta Ray Project, but also done her PhD on social interactions between mantas. So she's here to tell us a bit more about that today. Um, before we get started, I'll tell you the technical information. This webinar is gonna last around 40 minutes. We're gonna have Annie's presentation and then we will take questions. So as audience members, you're automatically muted and your video is switched off, but we would love to hear from you. So please do send in questions at any point throughout the webinar and we will take as many as we can at the end of uh, Annie's talk, not Abby's talk. Um, yeah, the Q&A box is on the toolbar of your Zoom screen. So just pop the questions in at any time. Um, and now I'll pass you over to Annie. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much, Glossy. Um, so yeah, hi everyone, I'm Annie. Um, and I conducted my PhD research, uh, as Glossy said, looking at various aspects of the social behavior, um, as well as conservation of reef manta rays in the Maldives. So I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about um, some of the research I conducted. Uh, and also share with you some of my findings. So I, I hope you find it interesting. Um, I guess before I get started, a little bit about me. So I first got involved with the Manta Trust, as Flossie said, in 2000, uh, 2013. So um, I was doing my master's and I previously worked as a dive instructor and got obsessed with manta rays, I think, which you know most people do. Um, and so when it was time for me to do a, a research project, I was desperate to do something with mantas. And um, so I found myself in a very lucky position of joining the, the Maldives team over the summer. And that's when I started looking at their, um, at their behavior. And again, I just got even more obsessed. And luckily this led to my PhD, which I finally finished last year, whoop whoop. Um, but I've also been really lucky uh, in the meantime, to work uh, with the wonderful Karen Fuentes, who we heard from on Friday. Uh, so I work as the project manager for the Mexican Caribbean project, which is super cool, it's super interesting, it's a really exciting population. So much that we're kind of learning, so yeah, keep an eye on that. Um, but yeah, I guess I should get back to my topic for the day. Um, so I was based in Baratol. If it will move. Oh yeah, I was based in Baratol, um, and this is home to Hanafari Bay Marine Protected Area. And so this was made famous uh, for the mass aggregations of reef manta rays that we see here on a seasonal basis. So I think, Sorry. hello. Sorry, um, are you wanting to share your screen? I am. Is it not working? No. Sorry. <laughs> oh, it's okay. <laughs> uh, oh, how do I do that? If you just click the share screen button on the bottom in green, oh. is it working? It doesn't seem to want to work. Hmm. Okay. Does it, have you got an option to share screen? It, um, on the toolbar. That. No. Oh, that's very strange. Um, all right. Oh, let me try again. Let's see how this works. Yeah, that's working perfect. Boom. <laughs> okay, I'll leave you there, but I'll be here if there's any technical issues. All right, thank you very much. Okay, so back to, uh, yeah, back to these mantas. Um, so yeah, I think this shot here basically summed up um, why the bay is so interesting. Um, you can, you can kind of see just the swirl of, of action that's kind of going on. So when conditions are just right, um, sometimes you can get 200 plus individuals that come together to feed uh, in this bay the size of a football pitch. And I guess what really intrigued me and became the focus of my studies was to see what was really driving these group formations and what was driving mantis sociality. 
Um, so in nature, not all animals form clearly distinct groupings. As you can see in the video, there's kind of lots of different things going on. Um, and it kind of suggested there's a little bit more going on with manta rays. So I wanted to get a better idea of what was happening socially. So I used the really uh, simple tool of watching manta rays um, a lot and over time. So I was able to build up a, uh, a catalog of associations. I could then look at the strength of associations uh, and this kind of highlights any evidence of social structure that's different to random. So I think before you really tackle this subject, I think you need to consider some of the core concepts. And I, I'm not going to talk about these for too long, but I do think they're, they're important to consider. So you first of all need to establish what constitutes a group. So in nature, again, some groups uh, form these clearly distinct groups, like you have a mob or a pod or a pride. So I can look at these animals in this group and be like, okay, they're all together, but not all animals. So um, group formations can vary due to the location or the season, or also individual characteristics such as age, sex, uh, relatedness, personality, or resource abundance. So if you're in an area where there's a, um, lots of resources, for example, there's loads of food, what can happen is that you start to notice fission fusion groups forming. So what this means is that the, um, the structure or the membership of a group is constantly being altered. And this is by the movement of individuals coming in and out of the group. Um, to say I've got an aggregation and it might split in half and I've got my two subgroups and they might split in half again. One half from here and one half from here, they join up and they start mixing and feeding together. So it's, it's a constant kind of mismatch um, of individuals moving in and out. And it's often driven by the movement or the abundance of a resource. So if you look at some important key biological factors, for example, uh, predation risk, there's some really simple concepts that explain the benefits of being in a group. So if you think of the, the selfish herd concept, uh, this talks about uh, diluting risk. So maybe an individual is safer if it's surrounded by lots of other individuals. Or the, um, the, the many eyes concept. So it's talking about reduced predation risk because there's higher vigilance. Or if you think of something like safety in numbers. So when you live in a group, you need to weigh up these benefits with the trade-offs. So perhaps if I'm in a big group, um, it's less risky, but we've all got to share these resources. Um, you should also consider environmental factors when you're thinking about these groupings. So again, it can be seasonality, can be habitat or resource quality. And these might vary across space and time. And so will membership. This can vary. And it might not necessarily be uniform across its dispersion. Okay, so those are your, your concepts. So it kind of led me on to the first topic I wanted to tackle. Um, and I wanted to look at the influence of foraging on the grouping behavior of manta rays. And I wanted to look at this on two different scales. So a large scale and a small scale. So large scale was my aggregation level, and my small scale were the foraging groups. Um, and to do this, I ran a social network analysis. So what are social networks? Well, they come in loads and loads of different forms. It's probably something which we're all involved in regularly in our daily lives. Um, so in 1967, Stanley Milgram released a study that said one person is connected to any other person within six degrees of separation. So this study was repeated in 2011 by Facebook. And what they said was that with this huge increase in social media over the last decade, a Facebook user is now connected within an average of only four. Uh, another example, really simple flight path plan for an airline in the US. You can see how interconnected loads of the different cities are with just a single airline. So individuals, are connected within a network of alliances. 
um, and they vary in their strength, their, their type, um, uh, or the dynamics. And you can look at loads of different types of behavior. You can look at um, when you're finding and choosing a sexual partner, uh, developing and maintaining cooperative relationships, or looking at things like um, origin or anti-predator behavior. So it's a really commonly used analytical tool. Um, I can look at group interactions and see how this is affecting the spatial position of an individual. I can look at gene flow and growth rates or dispersion amongst a population. So anyway, let's, let's look a bit closer at what these are. So the circles or the nodes, these represent your subjects. So for example, with the mantas, um, Mike uh, and Baba Ganoush. So Mike is the most commonly cited manta, also happens to be a lady. Um, and then Baba Ganoush, I think you probably all know Baba Ganoush, just a, just a massive sweetheart and I think we all love him. Um, and the lines show how they're connected. So for example, it's telling me how much time they spend socializing together. So this forms the basis for my analysis. Um, and I used Vereen's package uh, ASNIPE in R, the statistical package uh, program, sorry. Um, and I could basically throw all my data into that and I built my Manta network. And I could look at it on this big, broad scale. Um, but then I could also look a little bit more closely at some of those relationships. So I wanted to look at feeding events like this one here. So I wanted to start um, by looking at it on an aggregation level. And by that, I mean all the individuals I saw um, at this site within one survey. But you can see there's, there's more happening. Um, there's smaller groups forming. There's a chain. There's groups of two or three individuals. Every now and then you see a flash of the white belly. So you've got your solo somersault feeders. So it's, it's one feeding event, but there's loads of different things going on. So there was lots and lots that you could try and, and tease out the data. So I was studying uh, the resident population of reef manta rays in the Maldives. And this is a very cool population. It's the largest recorded population in the world. Um, and what's really interesting about these mantas, about this specific population, is that we do see them making these, um, these migrations in accordance with uh, the annual monsoon. What was also really cool is at the time when I was conducting this study, we were getting ID submissions in from, I think it was 21 of the 26 adults, which is a lot of information of, of where these mantas are. So that kind of data allows you to look at uh, whether these groups are here and then maybe how they're moving, uh, and as well as the individual journeys um, of these mantas. Um, we had a lot of the historical data, so over 10 years of data. Um, so again, you can look back historically and see how that impacted groups, you know, across year and across site. Um, now with this, I actually don't want to give away too much of the results from this um, because I'm carrying on digging, to be honest. Um, this is an ongoing study. I'm continuing to do some of the research. Uh, when we kind of look back on reflection and the sheer size of our data set, which was huge, and a very, very good problem to have, but it was huge. And um, we were also looking at the sort of types that were being run and kind of thought, oh, I don't think we've got to the true nitty gritty of what's going on. I like had a feeling, oh God, I think there's more. Um, and obviously in science, you want to keep asking questions. So I'm still asking questions. Um, but don't get me wrong, the current findings are very cool. Um, what we found was that there doesn't appear to be any structure. Um, and what we're seeing is actually maybe more site fidelity and the foraging behavior, which is driving these aggregations. So it's really cool and interesting, but I just, I want to keep delving. So uh, yeah, kind of watch this space. I'll get back to you on that one. Um, but as I was kind of running this analysis and I was looking at uh, things like the gregariousness of individuals, so how connected they were, uh, and looking at these 
associations, I kind of thought, gosh, I really want to, you know, delve deeper and I want to see what's causing individuals to adopt, adopt a particular position in a group or, or is there a specific role that an individual is taking on? So it led me on to um, my next topic, which is looking at the individual flexibility in the group foraging behaviour. This kind of brings us back to some of the core concepts of the social groups, which I won't dwell on for too long, but even when you have a transient aggregation, which can form due to the temporary resource, um, perhaps, for example, if you think of uh, a site where humans are regularly and actively feeding animals, well, a social group has a, has a more complex structure. So individuals are actively seeking out other animals uh, in order to associate with them and to co uh, benefit from cooperative alliances. So to benefit from sociality, groups need to um, make collective consensus decisions, for example, about what activities they're going to carry out and when they're going to carry this out. So this is when you might start to notice some leaders. Okay, a leader or a decision maker is an individual who, even when a group makes a decision as a whole, has more of an influence on the outcome of the decision. Whereas some individuals are quite happy to accept this and then they follow. Um, so sex and age can be quite an important motivator in the sorting of these roles. So for example, we see this in killer whales we see that females lead group, um, group movements. And actually, most interestingly, it's the postmenopausal females that lead foraging behavior in years of low food availability, which is really cool. It shows that there's obviously some benefits to follow an individual with prior ecological knowledge. Um, it's beneficial for reproductive success, and actually, in this case, just simply survival. So if we go back to um, manta rays specifically and back to their foraging behaviour, um, they can be seen performing both group and solo feeding strategies. And these were first described by Dr. Stevens in his thesis in 2016. Uh, and he's described eight distinct strategies. So some are purely solo, some are purely group, and some can be both group or solo. So this one here is probably my favorite solo strategy. Uh, it's easy to recognize. We see it commonly in the field. Um, it's somersault feeding. And this is often used by individuals if there's a really densely packed kind of patch of plankton. Um, I also think it's a bit like a dog chasing its tail. So the man can kind of swoop into it and it unfurls the cephalic fins to the fins on the front of the head. And they kind of act a bit like a scoop. So as they're performing the backward somersaults, they're kind of gulping in lots of this plankton-rich water. And it seems to be a highly beneficial way of consuming lots and lots of plankton from this, bitch, uh, this thick, dense patch. So for the purpose of my study, I defined individuals which were seen feeding more than two meters from other individuals as solo feeders. Uh, but mantas are also seen um, feeding in groups, performing group strategies. Um, this is thought to benefit uh, feeding efficiency, probably reduces energy output, and it kind of uses the simple kind of slipstream concept. So I think the most commonly used example for this is if you think of cyclists. So you have your, your lead cyclist out front, and they're breaking through, powering through the air pressure. And the airstream, kind of then the air pressure, sorry, reduces in their wake. And it means that the cyclists following kind of have to use less energy. This kind of, yeah, little idea of how it works. So just replace the mantas uh, with cyclists. Um, so I defined individuals that were seen feeding less than two meters from other individuals as my group feeders. So uh, what was I really interested in? What was I trying to kind of tease out of the data? Well, I wanted to know 
the individual IDs. So who are these mantis? Um, look at their, their age, look at their sex. And I wanted to see if there was any evidence um, that these individuals had uh, antigenic, so human induced or natural injuries. Because I thought this could be an important factor in how they associate uh, amongst group members or how they position themselves in a group. Obviously, it was interesting to look at group size. So I recorded whether it was just a single manta or, or 60. Um, and I assigned a really, really basic scoring system, which told me whether they were leaders or followers. Um, now, I'm not going to. I'm not going to go into too much detail about the stats, but they are very important. Uh, but I ran mixed models to see what was influencing group versus solo behavior. Um, I also wanted to see what factors were really driving the group formations. And, you know, quite unsurprisingly, it was the environmental factors which came out as the most important. So I actually found a key factor in grouping behavior in my study was food availability. So when there was a higher plankton density, more food in the water, we saw more and more mantas grouping together to feed together and our group sizes were largest. So it's, it's showing that there's probably is some benefits um, in this situation to feed amongst other individuals. So whether that's saving energy, you know, the hydrodynamic benefits, or there's less competition, things like that. But again, I wanted to take it one step further. Um, and I wanted to look more closely at these roles that were being adopted and who was adopting them. Um, and for me, the most interesting result uh, came out from the leadership models. So a key motivator in leadership can be individual state. You know, this can stem from having a more dominant personality or uh, the need to optimize one's position. That can be the need to uh, reduce your risk of predation or you need to intake more food. So my study found that sex was the most important factor for leadership. And specifically, it's actually your females who are leading um, the group foraging activities. So female leadership is something that we see, we see in nature, we see it in both marine and terrestrial species. So again, we see it in, in killer whales, we see it in lemurs, we see it uh, in baboons. So it's really interesting and I, I quite enjoyed that result. Um, but what was also interesting about this specific population is that Stevens found, again in his, in his PhD, that the females showed higher levels of site fidelity across feeding and cleaning sites than the males. So this, you know, this isn't uncommon in pelagic species. So males are known to travel more extensively, whereas females will often stay closer um, to a natal region. What I found super interesting is when I ran more tests, I found that ID of individuals was significant uh, in leadership. And again, what this means is that there was a small pocket of individuals who were more likely to be seen and more frequently seen leading. So consistent leadership, even in fission fusion populations like this one, appears to be beneficial. So we actually see this in uh, bottlenose dolphins in the lower Florida Keys. So groups that were led by a consistent leader were shown to spend more time in areas of high fish biomass they were traveling more direct routes, uh, they had less leadership switches, um, and they actually found that their home range was more complex than those groups led by a non-consistent leader, which is pretty cool. It's showing that the, ben the followers are benefiting from following an individual with prior ecological knowledge. And I think this is something that's probably happening here with the mantis. We see this specific pocket of individuals coming forward to lead and at certain times. So when we've got loads and loads of food in the water, this pocket of individuals are more frequently seen leading and more of those other individuals are adopting a follower position and they're happy to be led. Um, what the study also found was 
a high level of within individual variants, almost 60%, and zero among individual variants. And this was in group size. Don't worry too much about these specific terms. What it's basically telling me is that the manta rays showed no evidence of um, specialization. So now this is interesting because we often see specialization in foraging behavior. So there are certain birds and they demonstrate niche specialization and it's different between sexes. Um, it's different probably because the different sexes have different morphology, they have different physiological capabilities. When they stripped that back and they looked at the actual behavior, well, the males and females had different optimal foraging times. They also had different diving capacities. So what it kind of resulted in, it broke down to, was that foraging behavior became a sexually segregated activity because it appeared to be beneficial, um, which is it's really super cool, quite interesting, but not what we found with the mantis, okay? If you look at a region like the Maldives, the strong lunar uh, monsoonal currents, sorry, are what's really driving uh, the movement of zooplankton around the archipelago. So you have periods of increased food availability and in certain areas. And that is what is going to drive the seasonal nature of your sightings. If you look at an area like Hanafara Bay, so again, we know that the, the lunar currents play a big part in what's drawing in all that food, and with that food, loads of mantas. Well, the ephemeral or the quickly changing nature of the, the zooplankton blooms means that these aggregations can be very large, can have loads of mantas, but they can be very quick to disperse. And this explains why we had these massive and the biggest group sizes right during the, the peak tide. Now this is when the currents were strongest, um, but then they dwindled very quickly thereafter. So this result is basically suggesting that manta rays probably do have to be quite flexible in their foraging behavior. They do have to travel to areas which are more productive. This is probably why they are um, associating with other individuals to try and increase their feeding efficiency. And again, this is seen in other species. So you have um, the dusky dolphins in New Zealand. So they can be seen traveling sometimes up to 275 kilometers in a season. And they have to be very flexible in their foraging behavior, as well as their choice of, um, of feeding grounds. They also have high fission fusion dynamics. Again, this is this mixing of individuals coming in and out of the group. The whole time they're doing this, they're coordinating and optimizing their hunting behavior. So I kind of just flung loads of results at you. Um, what, it, what it basically boils down to was that this high level of within individual variants showed that mantas didn't seem to be repeatable in their foraging behavior. It suggested that they have to be quite flexible, in fact, in their individual foraging behavior. And that when we are seeing these group um, behaviors and we see how individuals are sorting themselves in a chain, for example, well, this is probably driven more by a first come first serve process. Um, but this flexibility is a good thing. Um, it means they're probably able to adapt um, quite quickly in light of changing environmental conditions. So it's a good thing. Um, but kind of moving on to a more kind of conservation subject. How does this information link back to, to us? Um, how can I alter or manage my behavior um, so that uh, I'm not interrupting or disturbing this really important activity? Well, we know that manta rays are classed as vulnerable due to the heavy exploitation in fishing. Um, we also know that populations can be very slow to recover from depletion. So the introduction of activities like manta ecotourism can be a safe and sustainable alternative to fishing if it's carried out um, safely and sustainably. 
Uh, we also know that groups of mantids are attracted by these, these constantly changing or these ephemeral zooplankton blooms. So it can bring in loads of mantids, but it can then disperse very, very quickly. So any disturbance um, of, of manta feeding, for example, if I'm, I'm very well meaning, but I'm slightly overexcited and splashing a lot, or if I'm trying to get that really good photo and happen to be doing it while I'm chasing, that can really impact and reduce their food intake. So we decided to conduct a study. Uh, we thought it'd be really interesting and really important to look at manta responses um, and manta behavior during human interactions. Because uh, we wanted to see what types of behavior are causing the most disruption. How can we really bring that down and reduce that? And ultimately, we don't want to be reaching the point where mantas are actually stopping their feeding behavior. Um, so myself and Ella, a wonderful student from the University of York, conducted a study looking at the science behind uh, these interactions. And what the science was basically telling us is that if you do actually follow the Manta Trust Code of Conduct, uh, your interactions can be safe and sustainable and cause as little disruption as possible. So it's uh, very important. But uh, if this is something perhaps you're interested in, um, if you want to learn more about it, if you find out how to get the best out of the interactions and obviously not disturb the mantas, uh, we, uh, we released it, we published it last year. So it's super interesting. So feel free um, to have a quick look. But in the meantime, I think that's, that's me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Annie. Thank you. That was very interesting. I love that females are often the leaders. That's my favorite result. <laughs> well, power. Um, okay, one of the questions that we ask everyone is what is one of your most memorable encounters with mantas? If you could pick. Um, oh, goodness. Um, ooh. Well, I've been very lucky. I've had, I've been, I've been lucky to have loads, but I always say this is all of my, my favorite. So my favorite manta ray is Adidas, and he's a lovely little male in the Maldives. And I first met him when I was doing my master's study, and it's when I started looking at kind of manta behavior. And I just had this crazy, cool interaction where it was just him and I for ages, kind of swimming around, watching each other, and, you know, just, you know, because he's really kind of, there's a lot going on when you're doing that. And I remember a couple of snorkelists got really excited and came over and was splashing a lot and, and freaked him out a little bit, bless him. So he, he kind of went away and I was like, oh no, a bit gutted. So I kind of swam away and then a few minutes later he, he came back and joined me and we just carried on swimming together um, for about 15 minutes. And so, yeah, that's my favourite. I've always, always loved him. That sounds awesome. Um, and another one is, what is your favourite manta in the Maldives, if you can think of one? My favourite, well, Adidas. Oh, you just said Adidas. Yeah, yeah, absolutely love him. But then, but then, I mean, Ad, Baba Ganoush, I mean, yeah. who doesn't love Baba Ganoush? He's, he appeared in a lot of my videos and a lot of my studies, as well as Mr. Spotty. They, they, they appeared in most of the videos, so I don't know, there's too many to choose from, but definitely Adidas. Yeah. What about turtle? Did you have turtle a lot? Turtle a, a, a lot. Um, yeah. She seems to love her somersault feeding. Um, so she'd always, I'd be trying to get like a, a chain, trying to get all the ideas of the, the chain. And then I just suddenly turtle would come in the middle of the shot and so doing her, her belly flips. But yeah, love her. Yeah, I've had her barrel roll. Oh, some sort of feed into me so many times. Um, yeah. But we didn't see her last year, so oh, really? we were really concerned. We kept being like, where is Turtle? She's usually there Yeah. every big day in Honey Faro. Um, maybe she'll be back. back. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, cool. Thank you. We have one from Emily. Emily has asked, have you ever seen any mantas associate with a specific individual or group of mantas for a long period of time or over their lifetime? Um, so I had, and this is what, before I started the study or before I started doing the analysis, I kind of had a different, I thought I was going to come up with a different result because I did see individuals who, in my mind, I was seeing together, not necessarily right next to each other, but within the same group. Um, and you'd see this over time and, and plus you'll know that 
when you're in the Bay in particular, time after time, there is, does seem to be a core group of individuals who are a bit like, oh, hang on, where's Mr. Spotty? Um, and so, yeah, I did, I did notice individuals who I seem to think were in groups a lot uh, and over time. Um, but apparently the stats told me that uh, <laughs> it wasn't due to social structure. But as I said, watch this face. <laughs> okay, so we might find out more in a few years time. Hopefully. Okay, cool. Um, okay, we had a question from Tom about how do the mantas know to follow the females? Like how do they know what structure to put themselves into? Well, in terms of how they position themselves, uh, we kind of came to the conclusion um, when we ran the stats and it came out as this, this strong within individual variants and it seems to be quite first come first serve. So I can't specifically see it say how they recognize, oh, well, hello, there's turtle and female, but it could be a combination of, well, she's going to take up that role of leader and she'll, she'll kind of head right there to the front. And then I guess from there, it could be a simple process of first come first serve and they kind of slot themselves back. I guess. Yeah, that makes sense. Just slot in where, where they get the best you can. position. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, we've had one from Miriam. Miriam said that was so interesting. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. And she's asking if you could talk a little more about the field work that you did. So how long did you observe their behavior for? What times of day? And was it difficult to analyze this data statistically? So there's a few questions in okay. there. Um, yeah, yeah, no worries. Um, okay. So I conducted this study over three seasons. So each season in the Maldives, where I was in the Maldives for six months. Um, and I tried to vary the time of day constantly. So I wasn't just getting videos in the morning or just in the afternoon to try and get a full scope of the day um, to try and make sure I wasn't focusing too much on one time frame. Um, and also, to, I didn't just focus on Hanafari Bay, there was a few different sites. So there was a lot of trying to make sure I could collect enough data from specific sites. Um, and so the actual process was, it was sometimes a little bit tricky because I had to obviously get the ID of the animal. Um, so it meant a lot of free diving and trying to stay under and get the angle just right to get the ID. Um, but when it came to the analysis, I'm not great at stats. Um, so for me, it was definitely a challenge. But what I think is really great out there and what I've noticed when I'm doing my, my PhD is how many other researchers want to help. Um, and so I, I, had to, I did reach out a lot, uh, especially when it came to the social network analysis. I actually contacted Damien Green and he was super helpful. Um, and I ended up actually attending one of his workshops. Um, but I also noticed, you know, when I was doing my, my chapter on the foraging behavior, I, I worked with a fantastic uh, postdoc, Raf, and I, it was just, it was great how much they wanted to help me uh, and help me along with the stats as I was doing it. So it, it wasn't the easiest thing, but people are really willing to help and share their skills. So, you know, that's a, that's a really good positive thing. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, one from Barbara, she is asking if there's any type of interesting manta behavior that you haven't seen and that you'd really like to see. Um, oh, well, I mean, I'd love to see a manta giving birth, but like, we wouldn't. Um, uh, I'd like to, I and mean, I have seen cleaning behavior, obviously, but I would like to focus more on that. So I, I did initially start collecting cleaning behavior, it became obvious that for this study, it was going to be more of a focus of the foraging behavior. Um, so it actually, you know, it's not a brand new activity, but I would quite like to, to look a little bit more closely at cleaning and see what was kind of going on there. Because I, I think it's, well, it's a super interesting uh, behavior and I think there could be something different going on there. Um, so yeah, I, th I think that would be cool. Yeah, definitely. Do you think that the females might also dominate on the cleaning stations? I think, that, I think potentially, yes. I think there might be something going on with the females, kind of in general. Um, so a, a great study came out last year, Perriman, uh, 2019, and he was looking at the social bonds um, 
and the, the structure of, of uh, reef manta rays in Indonesia. And he found, and he was looking more closely at cleaning, and he did find that there was more of like a long-term association, I think, between the females. So I do think that there could be something going, like with, in, in terms of the Maldives, I think there could be something going on there with the females, potentially. Yeah, I read that paper. It's really interesting. It's a, yeah, it's a really good paper. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. That will be interesting to find out in the future sometime. Yeah. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> one day. Um, okay, we have one from Lizzie. She's wondering if you've observed any differences between oceanic and reef manta ray behavior. So I actually, I've only seen oceanics um, before I started studying manta rays. Um, so I've actually only specifically studied the, the, the behavior of reef manta rays. Um, and the time before when I was diving for them a lot, um, I, I, I wasn't uh, studying. So I think I wasn't, I was watching them a lot, but I, I guess I wasn't really analyzing, but I would really, really love to, um, cause it'd be fascinating to see what the differences are. And I think that, you know, they could very well be some really interesting differences, but I can't answer cause I, I'm afraid I, I haven't done it. Sorry. <laughs> Fair enough. I know. Have you been to Formula? No, no, no. I'd love to go. When I was there, that was the first time I ever saw Oceanics last year in Formula, which is an island in the far south of the Maldives for anyone watching. Um, and I just noticed how curious they were towards divers. And maybe it's because they haven't really seen humans before, whereas the reef mantas are so used to us in almost every dive site in the Maldives. Um, but they would come past, swim out the blue, swim around your head, um, have a real good look at you. Um, so cool. Yeah, the encounters were amazing. Oh yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. Oh, I'll get there one day. <laughs> yes, you have to. <laughs> okay, we have a good one here. Um, Fred is asking, have you ever encountered a weird manta who just behaves differently to all the others? Um, oh, I don't, what's well, a blob? I don't think Shneso behaves distinctly differently but um so blob is missing an eye and and when her cephalic fin so i think it was probably from like a boat strike and i have off again i would often notice it was a bit like i said about turtle you'd be you'd have this massive chain going on and all these mantis feeding together and what you'd kind of notice occasionally is that that's a poor blob would just be like trying to do a few somersaults and kind of often like crashing into the chain who are trying to move out of the way of Blob. Um, so Blob was a little bit different. I uh, love, love Blob. Um, I've seen some young mantas that seem, you can, when you kind of see them, even from the surface, I remember we were watching and we could just see this little, little manta. It was kind of like really, I don't have to describe it, but just moving in a way an adult manta wouldn't. It's almost like an excited little child, but it's a, a little manta. Uh, and I guess, that was quite interesting to see. And it was kind of like swimming in and trying to almost get involved in like the adult uh, feeding and they weren't having any of it. Um, and that was quite a cool thing to see, very cute. Yeah, I saw a um, little pup at Hurai Faru once, one of our sites, and it was trying to somersault feed um, and kind of copying the adult mantas, but it just kept doing these really, really fast turns and they were all wonky and like it didn't, yeah quite know what it was doing and that was adorable i loved it <laughs> okay we've got one from the best spot azores dive center who've been with us um, for most of the webinars so hi to you guys they're asking if you see any kind of leadership during the night feeding when divers are using flashlights on the bottom oh that's interesting um i've actually so i've only seen mantis feeding at night twice um I can't answer that because I don't know, but I think that's a really, really interesting question, to be honest, and probably something I'd quite like to look at. Uh, very, very possibly. Um, that would be a really interesting topic, but again, I'm sorry, I can't answer it, but you might have just given me an idea. <laughs> How exciting. Yeah, it, you'd think maybe it would be the ones that had been visiting that site for the longest, but then... Mm -hmm. I don't know because I've heard it's mostly pups, but I've never seen them night feeding. So it's um, really cool seeing the night feeding. Yeah, Very exciting. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's on my bucket list. Is it called Maya Lagoon? 
in Ariadne? I think, yeah, I think I was in Maya oh, God, just years ago. I think so, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah it's, it's, it's amazing, very cool. Um, okay, cool. Um, we have a good one here from Eleanor. She is asking, if you had to study a different species, what would you choose? Oh God. Oh, that's really, ooh. Uh, I, I, uh, there's a lot of work done on killer whales, but they are really cool. Mm -hmm. I'd quite like to do something perhaps with killer whales, just because, well, we already know there's a lot going there, going on socially with them. Um, and I was really lucky to see them last year. And I was just managed to watch them for quite a while. And yeah, they're just fascinating and their movements and they're curious. And we already know this stuff, go, a lot going on, but I'd be quite intrigued to, to maybe do something. Yeah, something like that. Or yeah, I think they're, they're pretty, pretty cool. Where did you see them? Um, that was in, in Mexico on the Pacific side in, um, Oh my goodness, the name has completely gone out of my head. But on the Pacific side. Is it um, in Socorro or closer to the coast? To where, sorry? Socorro or that long word? <laughs> I yeah, that. I never name. pronounce it. <laughs> um, no, it was actually closer to oh. the coast. We actually, we actually just went out on a, on, a, um, on, a, on a boat and just randomly were extremely lucky to encounter a pod and... Yeah, and it was just the coolest thing, like being in the water with them. And because I mean, they're, I mean, obviously they're huge, but you go in the water with them. Yeah, but, yeah, but just because we were very lucky. Oh, jealous. <laughs> wow, amazing. Um, and yeah, so kind of just watching them, and they're just quite fascinating. I think you could just, I could watch them for days. Um, and yeah, I, I, I'd quite like to learn more about them. I think. Okay. Cool, thank you. Um, and last question now, which we've been asking quite a few people who've been on. If you had to recommend a book about the natural world, what would you recommend for someone to read during this time? Um, okay, so before I started studying, the summer before I started studying, I read Callum Roberts' um, Unnatural History of the Sea. And I, I just found it really quite gripping. So I love anything with history. Um, and this book tells of obviously the history of humans in the ocean and obviously we're quite destructive um, so but it's, it's a really interesting book the way it tells a story there's lots of interesting kind of anecdotes of specific parts of the world and particular species but it tells a really important message and a really important history but it's also just written really well and I remember that really stood out for me so I would, I would give that a read for sure. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I read that too as part of my York reading list for the masters. Yeah. So I think we both have the same reading list. Um, yeah. <laughs> really interesting um, introduction. And yeah, just showing how our, our perceptions of, of the ocean have changed over time as well from being limitless and you could never exhaust the fish supplies and now kind of like, ah, we've done yeah. that now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, really interesting really good read yeah okay cool um thank you so much annie that's right thank you you have answered those questions really well and it's been really interesting to hear from you um okay so thanks everyone for joining again we have some really cool webinars coming up this week we have one on thursday that is at uh 3 p.m with neve who is doing his phd at the university of cambridge looking at manta reproduction and then we have lydia green on on friday at 9 a.m bst she is in new zealand studying the oceanic mantas there um, which is quite an elusive population um, so that's going to be a good talk as always, you can learn more by following our social media pages, um, checking our website, and we'll be posting updates of all our future webinars here as well. So just um, stay online and, and keep informed. Um, we would love you to support us. If you want to support Manta Research or Conservation, you can join the Cyclone. It's a members only hub where we share all of our latest research, um, research expeditions and cool videos from the field. Um, and you can adopt a manta like Baba Ganoush as well. Um, and there's loads of other ways you can support us. So you can check our website for these ways. But for now, I'll say bye and hopefully see you on Thursday. Thank you, Annie. Thank you. Bye. Bye.